Center for Work and Family at the Ackerman Institute for the Family, and he teaches uh, in the Clinical Psychology Program at City College of New York. Over the past 20 years in private practice and in supervising clinics, he has observed the impact of difference in our personal ry rhythms can have on a couple. The night hours schedule can impact the morning person, the detail-seeking planner can dampen the spirits of the mate who loves spontaneity, and a person's punctuality or chronic lateness can have a ripple effect throughout the relationship. The very good news is that these personality differences are not unusual in a relationship. In fact, when understood and used properly, they can be a great asset to a couple. With Sync Your Relationship, Save Your Marriage, Dr. Frankel offers to every reader the techniques he has written about for years in professional journals. The four-step strategy will help couples assess their individual rhythms, prioritize the rhythms that are working for them, change those that aren't, and incorporate these changes into their daily lives. Please help me welcome Dr. Frankel. Thank you. Incredible introduction. Can I hire you as another publicist? I mean, <laughs> that was really a wonderful summary. I, that's what I got from reading your book. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I want to uh, also thank John Netzer, who uh, I think this is a direct with The manager. Manager, yeah. Bert, who I just met, and the gentleman I don't know how much. Yeah, but um, thanks very much. I, I um, this is really a thrill for me to be uh, having this be my first uh, book talk since the book came out on Tuesday. I grew up in Lexington, and uh, once I got my driver's license, I came here, bought the first book I ever bought, having driven to the bookstore. So uh, the Cogger Bookshop has a very uh, special place in my heart. And in fact, we were, there's Peter Tillotson back there. He's a bass player in the Jazz Arts Trio, which is my other life. And those lucky people who are here will get a free CD. Um, uh, and I was, we were doing a concert at the uh, Center for the Arts in Natick in December. And we stopped in here, and I talked with John, and uh, this is how I all developed. Uh, you know, um, before I read anything from my own book, I just want to talk a little bit briefly about um, some of the great conquered writers, that is, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, who had a lot to say about time. And as a high school student, I actually wrote a paper on Brook Farm. I was living Lexington, but I guess you could say I was a conquerophile, if that would be a phrase. Um, and so just a brief thing from um, this lovely uh, book that I bought here in December called Walking by Henry David Thoreau. Uh, I have met with but one or two persons in the course of my life who understood the art of walking, that is, of taking walks, who had a genius, so to speak, for sauntering, which word is beautifully derived, <coughs> quote, from idle people who roved around the country in the Middle Ages and asked charity under pretense of going à la santé, to the Holy Land, till the child, children exclaimed, there goes a santerer, a saunterer. Uh, a holy lander. Uh, they who never go to the holy land in their walks as they pretend are indeed mere idlers and vagabonds, but those who do go there are saunterers in the good sense, such as I mean. So the whole art of sauntering is something that people pay me a fair amount of money in New York City to learn how to do. And um, I'll be talking a bit about slowing down as part of my message uh, in um, sink your relationship, save your marriage, but um, speeding up is also sometimes useful. And just in general, uh, the, the focus on time. Uh, here's uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson in a beautiful book called the, the Tao or the Tao of Emerson, also something I bought here. One of the ideas that I talk about in the book is the different senses of time. The Greeks, we tend to think about time purely from a chronological point of view. But the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, had three concepts of time. Chronos, the clock and calendar time, by which we live most of our life these days. Eon, which was the sense of timelessness, which many of us now try to get by sitting, let's say, by uh, Walden Pond and breathing slowly um, or taking a yoga class. Uh, but then there was also Kairos, that is the special or opportune moment. And, um, and this is a lovely little passage uh, that uh, captures the sense of the special moment. Nothing is secure but life, transition, the energizing spirit. 
The one thing which we seek with insatiable desire is to forget ourselves, to be surprised out of our propriety, to lose our semi-paternal memory and do something without knowing how or why. So this interesting idea that all around us in the moment can be special moments is one of the things that I also talk about in the book. And what gets very interesting in the basic thesis of my book is what happens when partners inhabit different experiences of time. What happens when one, for instance, is very focused on the clock and calendar and the other is really trying to establish more of a sense of timelessness or seek the special moment. That's where some conflicts can occur. So let me read a little bit. So what we're going to do this afternoon is I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, my book has a number of self-assessment questionnaires and also on my website, which strangely enough is called sinkyourrelationship.com. Uh, there are other questionnaires available, so you can um, download those. So we're going to try out the questionnaire uh, to give you a sense of, of where you and your partner, present or past, is uh, on various aspects of time. And then we'll do some questions and answers, hopefully some good answers, and I'm sure great questions. So let me begin. Uh, this is from chapter one, Time and Rhythm, the Hidden Dimension of Intimacy. It was just about 20 years ago when I started noticing the power of time and rhythm to improve intimate relationships and to mess them up. I was a newly minted PhD in clinical psychology in my first year of postdoctoral training in couple and family therapy at the renowned New York University Medical School. I was also a professional jazz drummer, the guy who sets the beat and helps the combo keep time together. Walking into the consulting room for their first session with me were John and Tina. All names, of course, have been changed and identifying information to protect uh, confidentiality of my clients. Trim, blonde, and lanky, his face just starting to show the signs of middle age, John ex exuded a laid-back temperament. With a nervous grin, he plopped down on the couch, a battered pair of sneakers peeking out from under his slightly frayed chinos. At his side, perched on the edge of the sofa, sat, sat Tina, a slender, fine-featured brunette in her early 30s, dressed immaculately in sharp business suit, no-nonsense no pumps, and pearls. I'm saying that three times fast. Um, you know, alliteration is great when you write it, but trying to read it uh, can sometimes be tricky. I welcomed them and asked them to tell me about the problems, bringing them to couple therapy. Before I could complete the sentence, Tina jumped in, speaking in rapid-fire staccato. Well, you see, John and I met a couple of years ago, and actually we were get getting along most of the time, so it's not really us that's the problem per se, but how to deal with Tim, John's son from a previous previous marriage. Having run out of breath, she spoke a lot quicker than I just did, Tina stopped long enough for me to interject. So John, uh, what's your point of view on this? John took a few seconds to consider the question before he opened his mouth to speak. He had sort of mastered, I think unwittingly, the sort of the qigong or tai chi of ver verbal communication. He was very, very laid back. Very, both of them very lovely people. Um, so before he could even complete his sentence, uh, Tina jumped in, a hint of exasperation, curling the corners of her mouth and declared, oh yeah, and that's another thing, this always happens. John's never willing to talk about our problems. John's eyes met mine with eyebrows raised in a plaintive glance as he slowly intoned, I am trying to, but I just take a while to get my words out is all. By the session's end, it was clear that whatever problems they had with John's son, Tina and John differed drastically in their life rhythms, especially in one aspect that I call life pace. The speed of everyday activities such as walking, talking, eating, and getting ready to leave the house, among others. Not surprisingly, their professional choices match their personal rhythms. Anyone want to guess what professions each had? What would you think Tina or John did for a living? Probably one Wall Street. Stockbroker on Wall Street, Tina. John was a private boat captain. Uh, he took people on kind of private circle line tours around Manhattan, and that's how they met because her company had been on the boat and, you know, and they met. Uh, so yes, she was an investment banker and John a private boat captain. 
Like so many couples, those very pace differences formed a powerful form of attraction when they first met. Tina loved John's mellow style. Quote, he calmed me down, she sighed, remembering the early days of their infatuation. And John was drawn to Tina's up-tempo energy. She was so exciting, he said. And yet, like so many couples, over time, those same differences became major sources of irritation and misunderstanding between them. So uh, after 20, skipping over a little bit, after more than 20 years of working with couples and researching the causes of couple conflict and satisfaction, it's clear to me that unless couples can, quote, hear the beat of their conflict, they can't change it. You can't understand your anger with your partner until you realize the huge underlying differences in your pace or your tempo, that what's angering you is how slowly he gets things done around the house while he feels frustrated that you're always trying to complete tasks at the speed of light. Nor can you solve your persistent arguments about spending or saving money unless you realize that she focuses on the future, not just about money, but in general, while you live more for the moment, a difference in what's called time perspective, a relative focus on past versus present versus future. And there's a lot of research on that dimension and, and a number of them. Um, you can't overcome the fact that you never communicate, never make love, rarely have a date, or haven't had a quiet evening together in months until you realize that your work schedules are out of sync. And you can't explain to yourself or to him why you melt down when your partner is five minutes late to a date until you realize that being punctual is a key to keeping you calm and moreover that it was a point of pride in your family. And he can't explain why he feels you're incredibly rigid and unforgiving until you both realize that his family's strict rules about being on time made him feel oppressed in his youth. In all these examples, your rhythms mismatch, you do not dance to the same beat, and therefore you struggle. And yet when you go back to those early days and weeks and months of your love, you'll find that, surprise, lo and behold, the very time differences that now drive you nuts about your partner were, unbeknownst to you, one of the things that most attracted you to each other. You liked his fast pace and high energy. He loved your laid back side. You respected her incredible organization skills, her focus on the future, and she dug your beach bum catch the wave approach to life. Groovy. That's not important. Uh, you both wanted someone talented and competitive and dedicated to his or her career. And you got it, but not much time for each other. And you sometimes couldn't stand your own uptightness about being on time. And he was often embarrassed by his own lateness. So you each unconsciously looked to the other to provide a punctuality corrective. But when it was offered, it was too different. When we can hear the beat of our conflicts, perceive the time patterns that govern daily existence, rediscover the positives about them, and revise the patterns that lock us in distress, we can bring our relationship to new heights of connection and joy. In Sync Your Relationship, Save Your Marriage, I will teach you how to hear the clashing rhythms inside your flashpoints. You'll learn the powerful four-step relationship rhythms analysis. Number, f number one is reveal your couple rhythms. These are often hidden. We don't see them exactly. We focus on money issues and housework issues and discipline issues with the kids or you know what our weekends feel like, lifestyle. But underneath what I found are these differences in pace, punctuality, rhythms, uh, time perspective, and others. So that's step one is, is to reveal it in the, in the first place. The second is <coughs> to revalue the rhythms that work. One of the things that we know from lots and lots of research now on the effectiveness of couple therapy is that we simply can't uh, solve every problem or change our partner to be an exact mirror of ourselves, and nor, frankly, would we want that. Uh, research would suggest that we pick our partners for a mix, for a mix of things that we have in common and things that are different. And those differences are useful. If brought together, harnessed, uh, they become like binocular vision. Right? We get depth perception because we have two eyes that bring in slightly different retinal images. Same thing's true in problem solving for couples. If one partner 
you know, tends to want to have a very energetic weekend and the other wants it more laid back. There's ways to bring those two perspectives together and find a bridge. But the first thing you got to do is stop fighting as if you are the flag bearer for speed and, you know, your partner is the flag bearer for slowness or punctuality and, uh, you know, lack thereof or um, the future versus the past and so forth. So step one, reveal. Step two, revalue. Step three is to revise the rhythms that don't work. Obviously, we want to take a careful look at which rhythms uh, don't work. Sometimes you get partners who are, in fact, very well matched in pace, and they make themselves crazy because they're uh, rushing around so much. I had a couple, uh, you know, work in New York City, so quite a number of couples where both are very fast-paced. They went off to Italy, and they hit five cities in seven days and came back completely exhausted and wondered why. And um, because, you know, we, we've been raised now to think that we can fit everything into the little, you know, uh, little sections of these uh, 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 phones and, and calendars, and that's simply a myth. We're going to talk about five myths in just a moment. So we've got reveal, revalue, revise, and then rehearse. Just like a musician who's learning a new rhythm, uh, just like a band that's learning a new tune needs to practice. Uh, couples can't just come up with a solution but need to uh, practice those and you know, try them out in the real world. I talk about it as experimenting uh, with reality uh, as a team. So those are the four main steps and I apply those and you'll see how they're applied in the, in the book and you can help yourself and your partner uh, to, to change the groove in a way that ha allows you to have a more satisfying relationship. So just to get a feel for yourself in your own place uh, on various uh, uh, time aspects, we've got for you here the Couples in Time questionnaire, the brief version, which is from the first chapter. Uh, this will take you about a couple of minutes to do. That's perfect. Uh, yeah, this is your, uh, uh, unfortunately, lavender. Lavender, lavender for you guys, lavender. lavender. Right. Different color. Lavender one. So just, uh, I'll read the instructions. By answering these questions, you'll get a snapshot of how greatly time issues affect the quality of your relationship. For each aspect of time, circle one number from zero to three that shows, in general, how much of a problem this aspect of time is in your relationship. And you can think about a relationship now, a past relationship. Um, whatever you like. Keep in mind that sometimes problems are due to differences between partners and aspects of time, and sometimes partners' time behaviors are similar, but not working well for each of them. So do that. If, if you scored between zero and six, you're in the groove. And Bill, we always knew that you were. Oh. Uh, little or no problems with a couple time. How about uh, anyone between seven and 14? Okay. So that's, I would say, a little out of sync. Mild difficulties maybe need a little of a couple time tune up. And the book will give you lots of uh, examples how. And of course, today I'm here to, to offer as many tips as I can in an hour. Um, 15 to 22. Go on. We'll have a consultation a little later in the background. Uh, missing some, some moderate difficulties needs to change some things. And looking at the particular items that you. Um, you know, scored a two or a three on will give you a tip about particularly which chapters you want to focus on because each one of these uh, issues, uh, each one of these items is addressed in one or more uh, chapter. Uh, how about 23 to 29? Scored in That's the bass player in the jazz arts trio, <laughs> Pete Tillotson, who well, I've known since I was 14. Hi, like Pete. Um, and uh, he's a little out of step. <laughs> For a great bass player, I'm, I'm a little surprised, but we'll have plenty of time to, uh, to talk about that one. And how about 30 to 39? Anyone in the 30 to 39? All right, well, if, if you're 30 in the 30 to 39, it, it means that there are some pretty large challenges right now. But the good news is, and why, why I have focused on time so much, is that it is, I find, one of the most effective and, speaking of time, rapid ways to address often long-standing problems. Um, so. Let me uh, just read you a couple more vignettes, and then I want to hear your thoughts and ask me your questions and do my best to answer them. So, so as an example, money problems that hide time problems. 
Uh, in my first session with Cindy and Jerry, I witnessed their constant conflict about how much money to spend or save, a very common issue. Uh, at base, Cindy and Jerry's conflicts were just one outgrowth of a fundamental difference between their re respective time perspectives, how much a person values and focuses on the past versus the present versus the future. Cindy was a responsible and competent personnel manager in an advertising agency who grew up in a future-focused family in which every activity was scare uh, carefully scheduled and planned weeks or months in advance. Finding this oppressively constraining, uh, Cindy vowed to live her adult life making the most of the present moment. She invited friends over for impromptu dinner parties with just a day's notice or less. She once decided on a whim to fly off for a short vacation to a distant city over a long weekend. She would pop into a new restaurant and just walk by rather than calling ahead for reservations. And although fiscally responsible by most standards, she believed it foolish to save everything for a future that might never come and preferred instead to spend a high percentage of her discretionary income on present pleasures and passions. Her husband, Jerry, came from a family similar in some ways to Cindy's. With lots of regular routines, hardworking parents who scrimped and saved and planned in order to secure their future. But unlike Cindy, who had largely abandoned living for the future, Jerry was convinced that this was the only responsible and satisfying way to live. He preferred to plan social events and make res restaurant reservations well in advance, plan vacations a year ahead, and carefully manage the couple's investments for long-term growth. He regarded Cindy's desire to live for the present moment as, quote, flighty and irresponsible. She, in turn, increasingly found him uptight and anal, as she said, and complained that he was boring and unimaginative. So what do you think I did with this couple to, to assist them? Think about those four R's again, right? Uh, reveal, the first thing we did was to notice, I asked a series of questions that helped them realize that although they came from similar backgrounds, they had really different attitudes now about planning versus living for the moment and so forth. That in itself created more empathy. And one of the key things, uh, more than behavior change, uh, is to really understand and be empathic to your partner, to understand something about their history, both their family of origin and their culture of origin, how they came to be the way they are. That they're not doing what they're doing just to irritate you. <laughs> Usually not at all. Usually. My, my estimate would be 80 to 90 percent, even higher, of most uh, conflicts that couples get into have to do with uh, basically inadvertent differences. It's not that partners are setting out to hurt each other, uh, but rubbing up against each other. And time being a daily kind of thing um, is uh, sometimes time differences are really grating. grating. Um, so the, the second was, so we, we first re revealed and then revalued uh, their respective points of view. You know, uh, Cin Cindy could certainly remember the importance of future planning. She did it quite a bit herself already. It's really a matter of emphasis. And she certainly respected Jerry for where he came from. Um, he coming from a less economically advantaged family than, than she did. So she understood why he was so you know, uh, linked to uh, future playing, and it had worked well for his family, and he felt it was very important. And, and Jerry could start to see that there are ways in which Cindy's present focus could really help him relax more. You know, that, that they'd gotten to a point now in their lives where it didn't have to be everything planned in the future. They could enjoy a little bit more. They were doing fine. And so we figured out then how to revise things so that they, for instance, you know, simple things like, you know, putting some money away, but also creating a fun, uh, a, a fun account. You know, a certain amount of money that they put in every month that just was used for pleasure and enjoyment, to enjoy the present moment. Um, they decided that every other day on the weekend, you know, would be one day would be sort of well planned, and the other would be a serendipity day, as we came to call it. Um, so, um, and then they practiced it. They rehearsed it. They did it, and we refined it, and that was helpful to them. 
So let's let me stop here. Um, we could read on and on, uh, but uh, let me uh, see what your thoughts are, uh, questions you have. I wouldn't be surprised if if you're kind of going like, hmm, what what is this time thing? Uh, because it certainly took me a while <laughs> to refine my ideas about this. Just about 20 years. Uh, I had a sense as a drummer, you know, I'd gone to New England Conservatory and uh, in high school studied at the Berklee School of Music and um, with some great, great teachers, uh, Fred Buda and Alan Dawson. And so, you know, so much of my way of being in the world had to do with rhythm and noticing rhythms and playing rhythms. So as I started off as a couple therapist, I couldn't help but hear those things uh, and see the speech rhythms and see the interaction rhythms. But it's taken me a while to kind of like pin all this down a little bit. So I would love to get your thoughts, feedback, questions. It always helps me evolve the thinking too. Yes, well, I, well, I have the advantage of working at the bookshop of having been reading um, Dr. Frankel's book, so I have been exposed to this over the past week or so, and the reveal part, of just being aware of the different rhythms is really eye-opening. Mm. You know, instead of, I'm finding, instead of saying, something's always that way, I realize it's, it's a personality difference. Yeah. So it's, it's eye-opening, and I can see it. Um, I'm wondering if you think it's valid to be aware of these things, not just with a partner, but also with colleagues and friends and even my children. Yeah, are there tools in there that will help me young with my you know, children, with our different rhythms, or is that just being aware of it is really powerful enough right now? Absolutely. I you know The next book will be... Uh, actually, I'm already planning, which is uh, really to focus on uh, family rhythms. I'm a family, a couple and family therapist, and I wanted to first write about you know the core of most families, uh, or many families, uh, which is the the, uh, the couple. Uh, but I do a lot of work with families, and you know one of the things I talk about in the book is the way in which these time styles, if you will, are linked to fundamental biological temperament. And we've got increasing research now. Jerome Kagan, actually, at Harvard, uh, being one of the pioneers, uh, long-term study of, you know, from I infancy all the way to adulthood. He's got a study now where uh, he's following people now into their 20s and 30s that he saw when they were infants. And temperament, that is the speed with, partly defined by the speed with which we respond to stimuli in the environment, the general kind of pace that we're comfortable at. Some are slower, some more reactive, some like things fast and so forth. Um, th these are clearly partly biological uh, aspects of ourselves that then get shaped in family relationships. Um, so, you know, if you've got a kid who's extremely fast paced and sometimes that gets him or her into difficulty at school because they're kind of jumping the gun a lot, um, um, you know, maybe a little bit uh, uh, pushy with, with other kids, uh, wanting things always to be fast and activities to be fast. Uh, rather than getting, you know, mad, uh, you might get mad, but you might, <laughs> but you may also think about ways to calm and soothe uh, that, that kid and do it together. So I, I took a different bag today, but one of my favorite activities uh, with families where one kid is a little fast paced, sometimes has a diagnosis of ADHD or something like that, but sometimes that's not an appropriate diagnosis. It's really more uh, an aspect of temperament that's getting him kind of jazzed up. Do you remember these space tubes? Um, um, very popular in the, in the 60s, late 60s and 70s, they, they have Sorry to bring that with me, but it's, it's this stick, about this long, 11 inches long, with this viscous fluid and these sparkly things. And you turn, sometimes mm -hmm. it's used in a kaleidoscope. So try, I, I don't, you haven't told me what time issue is, but one, one issue, uh, one thing I do with a lot of families is have uh, each person take the stick. First I teach them um, just good belly breathing, the basic di diaphragmatic breathing. Anybody know how to do that? coherent breathing, it's very useful um, to do and useful to punctuate your day with because we tend to get more and more hyper as the day goes on in work. We forget to breathe. So I have the person, uh, one person in the family, let all the glitter go down to one end and then while everybody else is watching they turn the glitter stick and let the glitter fall down the, the stick and while they're doing that think about the glittery aspects of the other family members. 
What is it that glitters to them about <laughs> the others? And then tell the other people in the family, other family members. And then the stick goes to the next person. Well, this little technique, not alone, but in conjunction with other things you might do, uh, has had some transformative effects on some of my very fast-paced families where, where one you know, kid is really kind of hyper or something. Sometimes you've got the opposite thing. You've got a kid who's kind of slow moving and difficult to, as we call, upregulate, to get them moving. And so um, I've come up with some, also some techniques. Do you want to say anything more no, specific? No, I just, or? I was wondering if you thought it would be fair to, um, as I said, just the, the, uh, the knowledge, the reveal itself has been eye-opening. Absolutely. And I didn't know if that was a valid assumption or if, Absolutely. you know, children's person, they're so malleable and so they'll change so much, or maybe they won't. Well, not as much as you think. I mean, what, what we're finding is kids do uh, change. Of course, they learn, they grow. However, it, it, you know, it appears more and more that fundamental temperament, and, and as I say, time, you know, pace and rhythmicity and so forth, um, even things like punctuality can be kind of things that, that have, a, a, you know, to some degree, a, um, a biological base and then are shaped. Uh, for sure. But um, yeah, th these ideas are relevant to parent-child relationships, peer relationships among kids, um, you know, helping kids get along better with their, with their friends. Sometimes I work a lot with kids, um, again, sometimes kids who are a little bit on the hyper side, teaching them to slow it down and, you know, being able to see the fast pace that they're growing at and, and just recognize that in themselves. But also, um, I know that some of the things that help me as a faculty member, um, I teach in the doctoral program, as Don said, and um, I sometimes, I love my students, but it sometimes feels like I'm a bait in a piranha tank, you know, especially around this time of year <laughs> where people are desperate to get their dissertations done and everybody's jacking up the pace. And so I, you know, have now learned to use some of my own advice and work with my students. I have them sign a contract about the pace that, at which I can respond to them, and my colleagues, uh, my other you know colleague faculty members, have adopted uh, some of them anyway have adopted this little contract, which is you know take me two weeks, to get back to you anything that's 20 pages or less, and you know three weeks for anything longer, and that's been very helpful for them, and you know we, we also do a timeline together. We sit down, and at the beginning of the dissertation process, we lay it out. So. That's helpful rather than just sort of letting things kind of happen and, you know, get edgy as, as the time pressures evolve. You can plan so that the pace continues to be creative and manageable and so forth. Uh, but also, more and more, you know, I sort of remind myself to breathe. Um, and also, one of the things we know, I'm just thinking now about work-life balance. There's two chapters in the book on work-life balance. The first chapter on that topic is uh, chapter seven. And that's focused mostly on self-balancing kinds of things, how to manage the workload. So it doesn't have, it has to do with couples in the sense that if you'd use these uh, practices and techniques, you'll be in better shape when you get home and less likely to engage in what uh, we work family scholars called, uh, call um, negative spillover from work. You know, the, the preoccupation, the physiological arousal that you know, we end up um, bringing into our intimate family and other relationships. So that's the first chapter in that series. And then the second one is on things that couples um, can do that um, helps to preserve time for, for intimacy, for friendship as a couple, time for family, also there's stuff in there about family time. Uh, you know, uh, another questionnaire that uh, I can hand out, maybe Don can take. This is right on target for you. There's a whole lot of stuff in the book and this questionnaire on the website called the Time Allocation Questionnaire. Oh. So it's one of the biggest issues that I deal with, with with couples where, you know, partners have different ideas about how they want to allocate their time what, during the week and let's say on the weekend. Um, and it sounds like you and your husband have somewhat different ideas about that. He's become very passionate about this exercise to the point at which you're not feeling like you can reliably have time together. So um, 
one of the key concepts in the book, uh, I, I, I think I've met, mentioned in every chapter, is the notion of rhythms no, of relationship. And not surprising for a drummer. Uh, but the idea is that um, the notion of scheduling uh, the date is it's almost like a... Um, it's an old saw about couple therapy. You know, there are plenty of New Yorker cartoons where, you know, there's a couple in some outrageous situation, and the and the therapist or the counselor is saying, "Well, how about a date night or something?" You know, schedule a date night. And people often, uh, if you if you suggest to couples, you know, you need to schedule a date night. There's often a kind of a gut negative feeling about it. You know, they feel already too pressed for time. But there's something else which is, and this has to do with language that scheduling is a late 19th century, early 20th century invention, right? It, it was developed um, by, uh, you know, companies to get their workers to abide by the clock in more efficient ways. So there's a whole section in the book on, on this in chapter two, if I talk about it. Um, so the notion of scheduling is not a good metaphor when it comes to setting time for love and intimacy and, and just fun. Neither is routines, actually. There's, there's a lot that's been written about, you know, creating family routines. I, I find that has the same kind of like, okay, boy, now we have to have a routine for fun or uh, a, a schedule sex. That's the first thing partners, couples will say to me. You mean we have to schedule sex? Oh, no. I say, no. You know, it, we have to, you have to set aside time. But I, I think that the metaphor that we use is really important. And rhythms... There's a whole, usually, a whole other connotation for people. Um, and uh, it's critical that you set aside time. It might have to change week to week because of his running sickness. But, but you want to know that there's some predictable time that the two of you are going to spend together. So I, I think what you need to be doing is on a weekly basis or monthly basis, however, however frequently you can create the rhythm, uh, you need to have those reliable rhythms of relationship. You need to know that you're not, your intimacy is not tethered to and dependent on his running schedule entirely. That he is proactively wanting to spend time with you, which he probably does, but feels, you know, very beholden to this schedule, just as we do with work. You know, when people, for instance, one of the big issues in work-life balance is, you know, partners having different schedules you know, based on their work life. And one partner, often someone in an actually quite powerful position uh, in industry or you know, whatever they do, as a teacher or doctor or whatever, they're often someone who's pretty high in the, uh, you know, in, in the food chain at work, but isn't able to tell their partner when they're coming home that night or any night. Right? I'm working with, you know, I work with some people, for instance, uh, you know, in, in embassies and, and, and so forth in, in uh, New York and, um, you know, the, the very people who you think have the most control over their time often have the least because of clients, because of emergencies abroad, whatever it is. And sometimes the partner can't understand that. Uh, and so a little bit of empathy has to go to that person, but a bit of proactivity also needs to happen on the part of the person with the unpredictable schedule. Because otherwise, the other partner is waiting around wanting to know when there's going to be dinner, not knowing, hearing over and over again, geez, I just don't know. Can't you appreciate this is the kind of work I have? Is this make, make, making sense? So, so we want to not have an unwitting power dynamic go on here. And one of the things we know, when I'm doing workshops, uh, sometimes I do a little uh, equation. Um, we have that saying, time is money, right? And we certainly know that money is power. So based on the transitive principle in mathematics, what, what's the next step there? Therefore, time is power. And one of the ways in which um, company heads or, or you know, uh, people higher in the hierarchy at work uh, create the sense of being more powerful than people below them is by telling them, those below them, when they have to show up, making them wait. Uh, social psychologist Robert Levine wrote a, 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 uh, an article called The Power of Waiting. Brilliant article just about how making people wait <laughs> creates a sense of power. 
So we don't want to do that unwittingly with our partners, because it's hurtful and it leads to conflict. Does this sort of answer your question? I mean, the bottom line is uh, you have to have a frank and open discussion about how your um, having time together or not. And some compromise on this part, I think, will have to happen there. But it'll be easier, I think, if we don't think about it as um, you know, scheduling the time, but really, how do we create viable rhythms of relationship that can sustain this marriage, along with your passion for running and my passions for other things? You know, where do we come together in time? Without that, it's hard to have satisfying relationships. That there's a kind of bottom line, time bottom line. If you mm -hmm. you've got to be able to connect in time. We can be very separated by space. These days, we have the internet, we have other skyping and so forth. We can connect uh, even if we're thousands of miles away. But if we don't connect in real time, I don't know about you, but it's just not the same to email my partner or my kids uh, versus you know if I'm in teaching in Hong Kong, it's a whole other thing. It's very expensive on the phone, but you um, to be talking to them, to have the music of the conversation in real time rather than emailing. So, uh, I just want to mention five, because it's related to your uh, very good question, five myths about couple time that I write about in, in the book in chapter two. Uh, the first is the myth of spontaneity. And this may be partly, I'd have to find out more about your situation, but maybe partly what's happening for, for you. It's the idea that no matter how overscheduled our lives, that fun, pleasure, and intimacy should somehow just happen. Because after all, that's how it went when we were falling in love. Somehow we had, even though we were both working and really busy and so forth, we just sort of found time to hang out, have dinners, make love, long chats into the night. But now we're together for months or years, and that spontaneity thing just doesn't seem to be working. Well, no wonder, because we're chock full of other stuff going on. We've become, as attachment theorists would say, of a secure base for each other in the best case scenario. And now we're busy kind of re, you know, paying more attention to our work or to our running or to whatever it might be. So that's one myth. Uh, you can't rely on spontaneity to make love happen. You have to make time to make love, <laughs> you know, in the broadest sense of the, of the meaning of that. Um, the, the, uh, the second myth is uh, the myth of uh, total control. Um, so this is the myth that, uh, as I kind of uh, talked about just now, that um, we are masters of our time. But in fact, we live in societies, and we live in companies and families, and all sorts of things are going on. And we have to be realistic about all the different commitments that we have. and take charge as best we can. We can't wait. Um, uh, we, we can't assume that our partner has complete control of her time or his time. We have to be empathic about that, but also not rely on hope for spontaneity. Uh, the myth of perfection. Again, it's, it's this idea that planning systems, whether it's a file effects or you know, Google Calendar or whatever it is, is going to somehow um, solve your time problem, that, that if you just get organized, um, you'll find the time. But I'm kind of here to tell you that there's no time to be found. Time is not, time together is not like a little flower peeping out, you know, in Spanish Harlem uh, among the, you know, the, the cars and the passers-by. It's something that has to be created and protected, uh, even if it's minimal. And I have one little uh, technique that I'll do with you in a sec, but certainly before we end, because I want to make sure you get leave with this one. Um, so, so three so far, myth of spontaneity, perfection, and total control. The myth of quality time. We often see articles, hear experts talk about, you know, sure, we're very busy, but as long as the time we spend with our kids, for instance, is quality time, meaning that we are focusing, paying attention, really there, that's sufficient. <laughs> Research shows, including my own research, uh, that quality time is not enough, that we need quantity time. We need time to hang out. <laughs> uh, back to Thoreau's saunterer, you know, for creativity to happen in families, there has to be, and, and in couples, there has to be boredom. Uh, one of the great time scholars, Bertrand Russell, who was a mathematician, 
wrote a wonderful book years ago called In Praise of Idleness, uh, where he, he was one of the first to argue for the four-hour uh, work day. Now there's people writing about the four-hour work week. I don't know how they do that one, uh, but he basically said in four hours we could do enough work to raise enough food to feed the entire planet. And being a mathematician, we figured it out. And, um, and um, so he also talked about the importance of boredom. Um, in fact, uh, Henry Pachersky, who was an engineer scholar at Duke, where I did my PhD, uh, talked about how irritation and not necessity uh, is the mother of invention. Irritation. And boredom is often accompanied by irritation. What are we doing today, Ma? You know, and then you feel like you need to create some quality time, right? Uh, and in fact, boredom is a very important stimulus to creativity. Sitting around not knowing what you want to do together sometimes leads you to think about, well, you know, how can we resolve this irritation of not knowing what we want to do? And it le leads you to reach out beyond your accustomed activities. Uh, so we need time to be bored in order to be creative, to find new ventures, new things to do. The fifth, the fifth uh, myth is the, is the housework fun incompatibility myth. What does this mean? That, that we have come to this idea that intimacy, uh, whether it's with our partner or connection with our kids, um, cannot uh, center around uh, housework. And it's really a problem because there's a lot of housework to be done and other tasks to be handled, house management things, and they have natural rhythms. That's the beauty of them. The laundry has to get done <laughs> for most of us on a weekly basis. The dishes have to be put in the sink. Uh, things have to happen. Uh, laundry needs to be folded. Reeves need to be raked. Taxes need to be paid. And you can make those times for intimacy and connection. There's all this time. Sound like a commercial. Some of those commercials, if you see some of the, the intimacy commercials on. Really? <laughs> see, I don't watch TV. That's one of the ways I, I save time. It looks but, like that's <laughs> what they're trying to get. At. She's bored. Okay. <laughs> no, I just happen to see them. Okay. Well, that's interesting. It's very odd. Yeah. It's odd. Yeah. So, so these are five myths that really get in the way. Uh, so we want to make use the natural rhythms of mundane activities to make them and m moments for immersion and connection, idle, you know, easy chat, hanging out, talking, sharing a little. You know, my, my son, I just appointed him, he's 12, Noah, and um, I just appointed him the, um, the Department of Engineering in our house. That is that he has to, from now on, check whether batteries are, um, you know, still viable. So I showed him where the battery things are, and but we still kind of do it together. I bought him a battery meter. He's very kind of up for this. You know. you know, my daughter and I hang out while I cook. We do things together. My wife and I, you know, do taxes, and it's not really that unpleasant. We <laughs> sit around. You know, we have a period. I mean, and it's kind of nice. So I have one little activity I want to uh, leave you with. I know we're probably running out of time which happens all the time. Is that okay? Can sure. Real briefly? Okay, so how to have fun, pleasure, or even sensuality, whether it's by yourself or with a partner, with very, very little time. So this is, this is one of my favorite little techniques that I've been using for many, many years. Uh, and um, it's, 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 it works pretty well. And this is called the 60-second pleasure point. So here's how it works. I'd like you to think of all the fun, pleasurable, and or sensual things you can do, let's say with a partner, since it is, you know, say your marriage, uh, with a partner that, that only takes 60 seconds or less. Fun, pleasurable, or, and or sensual things that you can do with a partner in 60 seconds or less. Please, ideas? I'll take notes. It's a fun loving crowd, I can say that. Okay. 60 seconds or less. 60 seconds or less. Something you can do with a partner. That's 60 seconds or less in 
length. Yeah. Open a bottle of wine. Oh. That's right. <laughs> 60 seconds, you can open the bottle. It may take you a little longer to drink it. Okay. Open bottle of wine. Okay. Yes, come on, keep going. Make a toast. And then make a toast. <laughs> Lovely. Make the bed together. There's the <laughs> defeating the myth of uh, incompatibility of, of fun and, and housework. Okay, make the bed. Or I make the bed. Don't finding, forget, the bed you make is the one you lie on. Okay. Finding agreement. Boom. Huh? Finding agreement. Finding agreement. That's okay. You're starting to find agreement anyway. Uh, what else? Fun, pleasurable, or sensual activity. Sometimes just coming up with an idea. Yeah, like, let's go out for ice cream. Yeah, coming up with an idea to do something else, right? Okay. Uh, what else? How about lighting a candle? How about looking out the window? Did you know? Oh, my wife told me that. Yet yeah, the moon. Tell, tell, tell about the moon. I, is it peregrine? I can't. I, I the brightest moon it. that we're having right now. Yes. In 18 years or something. Yeah. But I think it's a star with the P, the term for it. Well, it, 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 either one. was or looked the closest to Earth. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, you know, taking a minute or less, or hopefully a little more to look at that, feeding each other a strawberry, right? Or sighting birds. Sighting birds. Take a photograph, see the nature. Or yeah, the nature. together. Um, can I tell you, one of the, the things I love to assign uh, couples who are in a lot of distress and have a lot of reluctance to do anything together lest uh, they start arguing. Because they go out, they try to have a nice dinner, and it turns into a fight or something. So one of the activities I give couples is to go into a new neighborhood in New York, uh, where I work, but it could be go to, a, go to a park you haven't been to, go someplace you've never been before. Walk around together, no words, cannot speak, and just point to things that you're noticing are interesting, beautiful, whatever, and try to get your partner gently, get your partner to see what you're seeing. So it's you know, I'm out with Bill, and I'm saying, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. like, and you can say like, oh yeah, oh yeah, something like that, and no talking. Okay, it's a nice sort of thing. So, okay, back to sixty seconds. What about a lot of the things that you named were things you would do when you're physically together, but. Again, we want to make use of the technologies that are available. What can you do when you're apart? So Dawes say, coming up with an idea. Right? I could be on the phone with you, and we could say, hey, you know, next weekend, why don't we do such and such? That's very pleasurable. What else? What else could you do when you're using email, you're on the phone, you're Skyping, or whatever? Yeah, that you can sort of show each other where you are right there. Like, hey, look, here's where I am in Hong Kong. You know, share a. A funny YouTube video. Exactly. Share a YouTube. Uh, call to say I love you. All right. That old Stevie Wonder song. I just called to say I love you. Um, you get the idea, right? Okay. So now here's here's the thing. So that's step one is just to come up with um, a list with you, you you and your partner or your friend or your kid. Yeah. And these these are things that you can do. Obviously, certain things you do with your partner and other things to do with your kids, but um, um, so let's just sort of take a typical schedule of a New York family anyway. Up by 7 a.m., somebody's leaving the house by 8, um, somebody, you know, people back together, let's say by 9 p.m., um, and then everybody's in bed, let's say by 11.30 p.m. So you basically have a day that looks like this, and there's time to be together. Oops. And then there's a lot of time that we're apart, and then there's a little time together. So what would happen if you made six of these 60 second or less, remember, or less, pleasure points happen? Just six minutes or less. Okay. So if you kind of glaze your eyes a little bit to squint, what does this start to look like, these dots? Like a line, right? The old Gestalt psychologist, not the Gestalt psychologists of the 60s, the therapy Gestalt, but the perceptual researchers, uh, Max Wertheimer, uh, Wolfgang Köhler, 
They did experiments uh, where they would put a set of dots and flash them and people would literally see a line because that's how our brains work. We make connections. Um, and so my premise here, worn out by a lot of clinical research, is that we automatically connect the dots of the pleasure and connection that we create across the day. That, that as we do one of these, you know, and then another, we've already got a line and a, and a, um, a, a kind of line of connection that's happened across the day. And just as another example of this premise here. What do you see here? It's a triangle, right? Yes and no. I mean, it's really just three dots, but it's arranged in a way. So, so the point is, with very little emphasis, and in here I'm talking about time, with very little input, you can have uh, a, a great sense of connection. You can really enhance the sense of connection. It may go back to your question. It's not necessarily that you know, we now have to make great gobs of time. Sometimes we can't do that. Uh, sometimes we go through a period of our lives when it's very hard to have huge amounts of time. I still think quality time alone is not enough. But, um, but we can definitely create rhythms of relationship that connect us over time and in time and you know, now use time as a tool to increase the quality of our connection. And with that, I wish you good time. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming.